On December the 12th, voters will go to the polls to decide who will represent them in Parliament and who will lead the country at this critical time in our history. So what's the truth behind the competing visions of the parties and what will their plans mean for you? Tonight I'm joined by the leader of the Scottish National Party, the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon. First Minister, welcome. You want to stop Brexit. Can I suggest that therefore you need a Corbyn government, and if it's a minority Corbyn government, you need to keep it in power until it delivers a second referendum? Well, there's a lot in that question, so let me try to unpack it. I don't want a Boris Johnson government. A Jeremy Corbyn-led government wouldn't be my first preference. I would rather Scotland didn't have to choose between the devil and the deep blue sea. But there's no other um, way, really, is well, there? Well, look, if, if there's a hung parliament and the SNP hold the balance of power, absolutely right, we have to choose, and I'm telling you which way we would... Uh, look, and I've made very clear I want to stop Brexit, but I also want Scotland's future to be in Scotland's hands, which is why I would expect Jeremy Corbyn, a minority Labour government, to respect the right of the people of Scotland to choose their own future. Because the, and, and I do want to see a, an option for the whole UK to escape Brexit, but of course if there is another EU referendum, which the SNP would support if the proposition is put forward, there is no guarantee that fixes the problem for Scotland, because we could end up with exactly the same result as we had in 2016, Scotland voting to sure. remain. I'm certain that bit would happen and perhaps the whole of the UK voting again. But as things stand, a Corbyn government promising a second Brexit referendum is your best hope? Um, I hope that any government that is elected, and you're right, it, that is more likely to be if it's a minority Labour government, would give the whole UK the opportunity to escape Brexit. But uh, fundamental uh, to this for me is that any party that is looking to the SNP for support has to be prepared to respect the right of the people of Scotland to choose their own future. And that means respecting the right, if the Scottish Parliament so chooses, it, to have a, an independence referendum. But if you really want to stop Brexit, if that's your priority, you're in no position to demand conditions, are you? Um, well, look, I lead a minority government. Any party that wants to be in minority government has to win support from other parties. And if the SNP is the party that holds that balance of power, then of course it stands to reason that I would want to make sure that certain policies and priorities were prioritised. I've set out the position around Scotland's future, but also ending austerity, uh, getting rid of the misery of universal credit, more powers for the Scottish Parliament, pending independence. But these are all priorities that we would pursue. But if you don't get any of that, you say, all right, we won't support you well, for a second right. referendum? Look, we will, we will always support a second referendum. We're talking so, here about... It's, what, but exactly, we're talking so here, you don't have bargaining well, power. You have to go along with it. That's not true, because you know, I, I'm probably the most experienced politician in the UK when it comes to the conduct of minority government, because I, I lead one. Now, I would actually flip the question on its head to some extent and ask if people are prepared to believe that Jeremy Corbyn, against what the opinion polls might be saying right now, finds himself on the 13th of December in a position to form a government uh, that he's going to walk away from all of these other things he wants to do because he's not prepared to concede the right of Scotland to choose our own future. But let's be clear, if a Labour government, minority Labour government, needed SNP votes to stay in power long enough just to legislate for a second Brexit referendum, but it refused, say, to grant you a second Scottish referendum, you would hold your support from that well, look, government? A, a minority government has, will, will have to demonstrate that it's got the ability to govern. And yes, I'm saying fundamental. I'm trying to be frank, and I think more politicians could benefit from being frank about this. I don't think it is reasonable for any uh, Labour leader or any Westminster politician to say to the SNP, give us support, if you, they don't accept that fundamental principle about Scotland having the right to choose our own So future. you might not get and, your well, Brexit well, referendum? I, I'm asked, you know, Jeremy Corbyn finds himself in this position. He's got big ambitions. I agree with some of what he's proposing to do. I disagree with other aspects of it. But all of these things he says he wants to do in his manifesto, many of them cribbed from former SNP manifestos, he's going to turn his back on all of that because he somehow wants to block the right of the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish people to choose their own future. I don't think that is a well, he might position. say to you, look, 2020 is for the second Brexit referendum. I need your support to get that through. And if you get a majority in the Scottish elections and the Holyrood elections in 2021, then I'll look at a second referendum. Well, of course, I won a mandate in 2016 in a Holyrood election for a, a second independence referendum. There's a principle at stake here. And that principle is that the, whether there is a second independence referendum and what the timescale of that should be is not for Westminster to determine and dictate. It's for the Scottish people through their democratically elected Scottish Parliament to determine. Now, I, I just don't find it credible that, because you, you've actually put your finger on a point here, it doesn't appear to be the principle of a second independence referendum. It could be the timing. Part. It's quibbling about but, now, it's the timing. So for the sake but, of a year, he's going to turn his back on his chance 
to govern with a Labour government and do all of these other things he says he wants to do. But I if, don't find that credible. If he says, look, on Trident, I'm a minority Labour government. I'm, I'm on your side on Trident, he could say. Well, that's but not I, what his manifesto says. I understand, but I'm talking about him, yeah. not his manifesto. Uh, he said, but I'm a minority Labour government. I can't deliver what you want on Trident. I really can't deliver a Scottish referendum again before 2021. You would bring him down? You well, wouldn't like, support him? I mean, we know what last time when the SNP turned on a minority Labour government. I mean, would, 18 years of Tory firstly, rule. Firstly, I would never do anything to support a Conservative uh, but, government in office. No, no. But the fact he knows that do. means that you well, don't really have no, the bargaining because, power. Again, I keep coming back to this point. I, I lead a minority government. I can't get a budget through unless I win support from other parties. He's not going to be in a position of being able just to say, I'm not going to do anything you want. Now, I also accept that in any discussion of this nature, if we're in this position after this election, it's because no party's got an overall majority and discussions will be required. Compromise will be required on all sides. I, I get all of that and I accept that. I'm simply being Handed, uh, not just with you, but with voters in Scotland and across the rest of the UK, the issues that really matter uh, to okay. me as leader of the well, SNP and as First Minister. Let's see how candid you are, because three years ago you said that another Scottish referendum could only be justified if there was, quote, significant and material change. Mm -hmm. And one of the examples you gave was Scotland being taken out of the EU. But if you get your second Brexit referendum and we don't leave... You don't have your material change. Well, well, you've actually, I think, just in the way you asked me that question, demonstrated part of the answer to it. One of the examples that we put forward was being taken out of the EU. I said that. But over the past, exactly, so not so, the but only... if you don't get taken out, if you win the second Brexit referendum, we don't well, leave, the proposition what's the apologies? material change? The material change, frankly, is the way in which Scotland has had it completely demonstrated to it over the past three years that our views and our voice doesn't matter. We have... We've you've always said that. Well, You've but always like, told us it was just horrible. And, it, and it's always been true. Uh, right, so you knew that in 2016, well, but you didn't but make had, that a condition of a new had, referendum. So since 2016 and since we did this interview in the 2017 election, I've tried very hard on behalf of people across Scotland to compromise. I was prepared to find a compromise around staying in the single market and the customs union. We've sought to influence the direction of the negotiations. Uh, we've been treated with contempt, disinterest all along the way. Now, the point is, I do hope there is a second EU referendum for the whole of the UK to escape Brexit, but there is no guarantee in that that Scotland that. ends up in but, that position. But, but if, and we, if we do stay in the EU... Against the odds, perhaps, sure. if we do, you've lost your material change. You also said well, there had to, to be, be clear and sustained evidence of, on opinion polls, not a couple of opinion polls, that Scotland wanted independence. You don't You're, have that. You, you might, you, neither of the conditions you laid down for a second referendum in Scotland might well, be I'll, met. I, we're in an election, I'll publish a manifesto later this week, and that will set out very clearly the proposition I'm seeking support for in this election. Because, you know, the scenario you've just painted for me there, if that happens, there is still no guarantee. I mean, Nigel Farage and the Brexiteers are not going to go. This is going to dominate Westminster politics for a long, long time to come. And Scotland has had it demonstrated to it beyond any doubt over the past three years that right now our future path as a country is not in our own hands. It's in the hands of Westminster politicians like Boris Johnson with his strings being pulled by Nigel Farage. I think it is time for people in Scotland to have a choice about whether that's the kind of future we want or instead do we want to have a different kind of future, one that we determine but, ourselves. But you see, you laid down clear conditions three years ago for a second Scottish referendum, and if they're not met, well, and one of them hasn't been met on the opinion polls, the other one might not be with a second well, Brexit uh, referendum, actually, you say, I'll just come up with some more reasons I, well, for a second well, referendum, it doesn't mean well, anything. Firstly, three years ago is a long time. It feels a lot longer, I have to tell you. But you, you put to me there one of the conditions about increased support for... In, most of the polls, almost all of opinion polls, show increasing support for independence. They show increasing support for a second... They do not show clear and sustained well, look, evidence that a majority of Scots favour independence. Your words. Well, you, you, you're quoting different things to me here. I stood on a, a manifesto. I'm standing on a manifesto in this election. And I'm putting to the, the people of Scotland a proposition that all of the experience of the last three years says that we should take our future into our own okay. hands. Now, Scotland might choose independence. I believe it will if it's given the chance again. But whatever future yeah. Scotland chooses in that regard, it should be ours to choose. It shouldn't be dictated to us. Suppose we leave, the United Kingdom leaves mm -hmm. the EU in 2020, and you get your second yeah. Scottish referendum. Maybe not to 2021, but you get it. And you win. How long before Scotland could rejoin the EU? Well, I'm not going to give you a, a specific timescale for that, Just right? Give me a bob. In all of my experience of discussions in the, with different interests in the European Union, I think that could be relatively quick. But that will depend on the discussions we have. Uh, we you know, understand the conditions we would require to meet and the, the discussions that would require to take place. But you know, if we're in a position of Scotland being taken out of the European Union, uh, then we will be seeking a way back in. There will be other that. options, for Scotland. There will be other options for Scotland in the interim, for you, example. You said relatively quick. That's not what the SNP's own Growth Commission says. It says it could take up to 10 years. Look, At I, least well, five and up to 10. 
I, I'm not entirely sure what bit of the Growth Commission you're quoting to well, me there. It's, oh, right, well, I tell you, it says that to join Scotland would have to create its own stable currency. That no, 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 no. With, with the greatest respect, Andrew, I don't think because that is not a requirement necessarily of joining the European Union. What you're quoting to yes, me there. Yes, You on, have, to, you have to have your own currency. No, it has to be not, stable. That is not. And you true. have to have an independent monetary you're, policy. You're, I think you may find that you're slightly mistaken on some of that. Uh, but can I set out what you, you've quoted to me there? A part of the Growth Commission, and then you have said that the Growth Commission said it would take five to ten years for an independent Scotland to join the European Union. That is not accurate. Um, I don't have the Growth Commission report in front of me, but I. I'm pretty certain that that is not well, an accurate the, quotation. The Growth Commission set out six economic tests. For, for establishing a currency. For your own uh -huh. currency. And it says in the interim you would use the pound. Yes. But you wouldn't be part of the UK no. Monetary Union. But we would be setting up a, a central bank. We would be setting up the infrastructure that is required for that. That is part of the discussion right. we would have about the European Union. But it is not true to say we would have had to have established an independent currency before joining the European Union. But in the situation we're talking about, England, the rest of the UK, would no longer be in the EU. You would still be using the pound, mm -hmm. but you wouldn't have monetary union. You're seriously saying that you would try to join the EU using the currency of a country that is no longer in we've, the we've, EU? We've set out Brussels wouldn't allow well, that to first, happen. Firstly, the pound is Scotland's currency right now. The proposition is that until the conditions were right to establish our own currency, which we've said would be our objective, then we would use the pound to do that. And right, but not in the monetary country, union. Not, well, not in a monetary union. Now, as we argued in 2014 for a monetary union, I think there is still and an that argument. Was back. I think it's still an argument for a monetary union, but clearly uh, what was demonstrated in 2014 is that Westminster could operate a veto on that. So we've set out very clearly the conditions for moving to a separate currency um, and the preparations that would require to be made. So you're conflating certain things in well, your I'm, questions. I'm following to me here. your own growth commission well, because well, it, it says the grace, that if you use the, the pound. With respect, Andrew, I don't think you are entirely. Well, the, what the growth it. commission says is if you use the pound as a transition mm -hmm. until you get to your own currency, Scotland would not secure monetary policy sovereignty for in, in during independence. You would still have to follow the Bank of England. And it's clear in that situation you could not join the EU. You would have to wait till you've got well, your own th currency. This is where I, I'm absolutely certain the Growth Commission does not say that latter point. We would have a discussion with the European Union about the journey an independent Scotland was on in terms of currency and the uh, accession, if Scotland was already out of the European Union, to the point where we rejoined the European Union. You know, there is uh, a number of things that would require it's very to, to be done. But look, Scotland faces right now the uncertainty of being ripped out of the European Union against our will. It's not of our making. Uh, and we need to plot the best way forward right. for our country, where we are in charge of the decisions that we take. Well, one of the Commission's tests, your own Commission, mm -hmm. was that to establish your own currency, you need to build up substantial reserves in a new Scottish currency. But Scotland runs a large budget deficit, it largely runs a large balance of payments deficit. How could you ever build up these reserves? On the deficit, Scotland's deficit right now is reducing. The last time I think you and I had a discussion about this, Scotland's deficit was somewhere close to 10% of GDP. Everybody's deficit it is down. It is down. Well, but you're asking me about Scotland's yeah. deficit. But, Scotland's but you deficit still plan to run a deficit. But so how the, could you build up reserves? The Growth Commission sets out a, a deficit reduction plan over a, a period. Our deficit is already down to well, 7%, seven. Which is still the largest in because, Europe. Well, but it's down from substantially because our revenues are rising. Uh, our job it, is to accelerate the progress of that, as the Growth Commission sets out in detail. But it never sets out a surplus. It sets out a target of a 3% well, deficit. How do you, you build up currency reserves if you're running deficits? If you, if you take the Growth Commission, which you've obviously read maybe not closely enough, but our def Scotland's deficit is already lower than the Growth Commission estimated it would be in 2020-2021. So our deficit is reducing at a faster rate than the Growth Commission anticipated. It could our go up against to... this year. I mean, the but, British but, deficit but is going up. That's the point. And your deficit the, could the go risk up. to Scotland right now is of Brexit. It's let Brexit me, that is posing the risk. Let me try one deficit. more time. How do you build up substantial get... currency reserves if you're running both an external and because, an internal because deficit. Because our task is to get our deficit reducing faster. Uh, that is principally through growing our economy faster, which remaining in the EU or returning sure. to the EU helps us to but, do. But at and no stage do you that... say you'd run a surplus? Yeah, well, I, th I think over time, of course, we would aspire to run uh, a surplus. Uh, after 10 to... years, you're still planning a 3% well, deficit. The point I've already pointed out to you, our deficit is reducing at a faster rate than it was anticipated. When we think it's it... 12 billion. It's the biggest in Europe. And it's... I've just pointed out to you, it's 3% lower than it was the last time you and I had this discussion. It has reduced at a faster rate than the Growth Commission anticipated. Our job, which would be easier with independence, is to grow our economy faster to right. get our deficit reduced. And that's what the Growth Commission says, that you would grow a bit faster, though it just takes 
tax-exempt figures. Actually, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. The Growth Commission assumes trend growth rate. Our but, job but it then adds one percent to... on to get your spending plan, so that you grow as what you think small economies grow. But there would still have to be tight spending controls, and this is what the Institute for Fiscal Studies says of this plan that it implies at least another decade of the sort of restraint on public spending that Scotland is currently, currently experiencing. If current policy is austerity, austerity would continue under the Commission's proposals. The, the, Why would Scotland vote well, for that? I don't, I don't accept that characterisation. The, the, the IFS. Well, well, and I've got a great respect for the mm -hmm. IFS, but I'll tell you the reasons why I, I don't. Firstly, um, in terms of what the Growth Commission said in terms of spending increases, it recommended spending increases above the rate of inflation. It also has some very strong messages about times when growth was lower uh, than desired, uh, the case for spending more in these periods in order to boost the economy and expand the economy. But you, know, you can illustrate the point by looking backwards. If the Growth Commission recommendations on spending in an independent Scotland had been applied over the past 10 years, Scotland wouldn't have suffered the austerity cuts actually, to our budget that we have suffered. And actually, I saw a figure that the cuts would have been 50 billion more than well, they've been over that 10 years. I can assure you that years. is not the case. If, so if I've was, seen no... Where's, well, the, I, where's the economic model that has done that? If you apply those figures... Well, who's done that modelling? Um, I, that I've had that figure done by... Because I've seen modelling that shows it would have been much know, worse I, I than the austerity I don't know what your modelling uh, is, but I'm saying that if you apply those figures to the last 10 years, yes. then but there wouldn't have been the austerity cuts to Scotland's well, budget. We look forward to seeing the modelling on that. You, I look forward to seeing yours as well. You've used research... Uh, that says Brexit would increase UK-EU trade friction because we'd be outside the EU. We couldn't trade the way we do now. And over time, you've pointed out, this research says it would cost Scotland 80,000 jobs. But you claim that independence would create no trade friction with the UK, no, no job it's, losses, it's not in no loss of living standards, nothing to see here, just move on. Well, I'll come on to Scotland in a minute, minute but just... For illustrative purposes, if you look at when Ireland was able to combine independence with membership of the European Union, actually that increased Ireland's prosperity. It allowed them to expand and diversify their export base. Now, on the question of trade friction, if friction, it is not. I want an independent Scotland to be inside the single market. I want the UK to be inside the single market. I don't want it's the... Brexit. Well, I don't be. think you can say that definitively. You're right. It's looking well. That's the deal that's been done. But is it, we, exactly. we, we wouldn't be in the customs you union under the Johnson earlier deal. earlier on about the possibility but, of Brexit perhaps being reversed. So no, no. But <laughs> I mean, we're not talking about on the basis we yeah, leave. Sure. You would be in the EU customs union if you get your independence yeah. on mm -hmm. EU membership. The rest of the UK would be in but its own don't... customs union. There would you're, be you're trade asking friction. Me here. You're asking me here about friction at, at the border mm. between... Well, you've talked about it. Well, I, I want to, because I actually think it's a really important point, and I want to say it out pretty candidly. Um, I think for the benefit of your viewers, it's important to recognise what we're talking about, goods and services. The common travel area between the UK and Ireland will continue post-Brexit. There's, you know, That's passport-free travel. There's no suggestion or reason that wouldn't apply to an independent Scotland as well. But we, we don't yet know the final relationship between the UK... Oh, can you let me finish this point? We don't yet know the final relationship between the UK and the EU. But we know it won't be as friction-free as it is okay, now. So, but when, and therefore but it won't we, be as friction-free with an we, independent so Scotland. What we need to do when we have greater clarity on what that relationship is going to be, because it's not independence that causes this, it's Brexit that causes this. I understand we that. Be, we need to be clear clear about any implications for Scotland and how we reduce and take away the impact of that on any trade flows. But if you and have we... an independent Scotland inside the EU and the rest of the United Kingdom outside the EU, of course there's going to be some trade friction. I mean, less than 20% the... of your trade is with the EU. Over 60% uh, is with the rest of the United well Kingdom. Figures, and the but, idea but... that you could lose 80,000 jobs we're... because we leave the EU, but you the lose no making... jobs because you I'm leave actually, the I'm actually trying to answer your question candidly here. I'm simply making the point we don't yet know what the UK's final relationship with the EU will be. When we have clarity on that, we have to understand the implications and we have to set out clearly how we deal with those implications in order to keep trade flowing between Scotland and England, okay. which is an our interest and it is in the interest of the rest of the UK, but it is also in our interest to stay part of the single market that is eight times the size of the UK market. Which, because which actually, you only export because, less than 20% well, of but your this exports. Is, but this is the point. Our exports to the European Union are increasing. And again, to go back They're to the... increasing to the UK too. Yeah, absolutely. But, and, and there is a, a benefit and an advantage to Scotland to grow our EU exports further. And the experience of Ireland, albeit in a different time in history, is when they combined that independence with membership of the European Union, their exports to the European Union grew and they became more prosperous. Right. That's the best of both worlds that I believe Scotland can attain. We're still the market for Ireland, and uh, Scotland, Ireland imports more from Scotland, us than anybody Scotland's else. Scotland's trade with the rest of the UK is important. I am not saying it's not. Let, let, and the rest of the UK's trade with Scotland let, is important, and it's a priority for me to make sure that that let continues. Let me ask you this. You've argued that any Brexit deal should be put to the second referendum. 
But you're against any Scottish independence deal being put to a confirmatory referendum. Isn't that just self-serving and inconsistent? No, I don't think it is, because I don't believe that it was inevitable that we ended up in this position with Brexit. I oppose Brexit, but the mess that Brexit's become and the lack of clarity and the lack of progress wasn't inevitable. Sure, but put that your was independence to, deal well, to a confirmatory referendum if you ever get one. In 2014, and it would be my intention exactly the same would be true in another independence referendum, the detailed proposition was put to people in advance of the vote. That was not the case in the Brexit referendum. It just there was no wrong. detail apart from the side of the bus. You, you, your 2014 white paper on base and independence said there would be £8 billion of oil revenues by 2016. What was the real figure? Well, look, the, 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 oil, figure? the oil price reduced and that was not million. possible at that point. You said that you, that you would remain part of monetary union with the UK. That was a key part of your white and, paper. And if there had been a yes and, vote there, I, I believe we would have stayed part of the monetary union with the UK. turned down by all the main Westminster yeah, well. parties. The fact is that the deal you could have eventually done would have not been the same as the white paper the same could happen again. You need a confirmatory referendum. Well, I believe if you put your case forward, if you argue that case, if you tell people how you're going to pursue at that case, then those two things but are not the same. You can't tell us what currency Scotland would have. You can't tell us I when we'll be able to rejoin the EU. You don't know if we're going to have our own currency, whether I've we use said the it, pound. You, and you've quoted, not always accurately in my view, but you've quoted at length the Growth Commission, setting out that we will use the pound, setting out the test and that we will apply to move to our own currency. But you accept that you can't join the EU with the pound? You've accepted no, that? No, I didn't accept that. I actually, I actually challenged that. OK, well, we'll <laughs> to see what the Growth Commission accurate. said. Let's, as we come to the end, let's look at your record in health. You said all Scottish patients, 100%, mm -hmm. should start receiving treatment within 12 weeks. Did you wrote that guarantee into law when you were Health Secretary, yeah. longest-serving Health Secretary? What proportion of patients are getting treatment within 12 uh, we're, we're not meeting that, what, what that target. It's below, it's the 80% um, or so. It should be no, 95%. No, 72%. Um, but we're not meeting that target. We're not meeting... Well, it's, yeah, like, it's 72. Indeed, it is not good enough. But all health services are undergoing pressure from increased demand. Scotland is no different there. What is different in Scotland is the focus we are bringing now to uh, addressing these issues. So if you take the Audit Scotland report that was just published uh, a few weeks ago, a couple of months ago, their annual report on performance of the NHS, they say that on seven out of the eight key waiting times targets, including uh, that one, there are now more people being seen within those targets than was the case in but the year before. But they also said that out of these eight targets, you're only hitting two of them. Uh, absolutely. Uh, two out of eight. Absolutely. And, and can I just say, you made this 100% target a legal guarantee. I mean, have you and the health ministers been charged with breaking the law? Uh, it's not a criminal uh, law, but... No, but it's a civil offence. But, but it sets out the steps that well, health have to take. Guarantee. We have set out... We've, we've got an £850 million pounds waiting time improvement plan underway. The Audit Scotland report, which like, you've so, quoted to me so, as well, more patients are being no, seen within these you, targets now than well, in the year before. What's the point of a legal guarantee, then? It means nothing, does it? Well, there's 1.8 million people since that came into uh, operation that have been seen within that target. It's that still would not only 72%, which is meant to be 1.8 million people have been benefited from that. That is you the can point of having those kind of targets. You are, you are way behind. I, I'm not, denying, I, I'm behind not denying, denying that. All health services have these challenges. We are addressing these challenges. In many of these targets, we, uh, a &E, for example, we are we ahead of the performance of health services in other parts of the UK. Well, do you think it's a, a, the, the, it's a comfort to no, someone in Glasgow that they're not having to wait no, as long for what, somebody in Glasgow? No, 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 I don't. What I'm saying, I regularly get challenged by Conservatives and Labour in the Scottish Parliament saying if only we were in power, it would be so much better. I don't think it's unreasonable to say, yes, we have challenges in Scotland, but we are dealing with these challenges more effectively well, you say you're than these with other them, parts but of the UK. Look, only two of your eight waiting time targets are being hit. You've been in for a long while. You haven't hit the A and E target since 2017. The two-month cancer target you haven't hit since 2013. Children are dying in a new Glasgow hospital because the water's contaminated, oh, perhaps we... by pigeon droppings. A new multi-million pound Edinburgh hospital should have opened in 2012. It's still unfit to open. You can't even get the ventilation system to work. You've got the worst drug addiction problem in Europe, but you cut drug treatment budgets by 15 million. You clung on to your last health minister. You're under pressure now to sack the successor. I mean, you've called for legislation to protect the NHS from Donald Trump. Maybe the NHS needs legislation to protect it from Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, well, obviously, I don't think that's the case because we are focused on addressing. You've put forward a number of legitimate issues there that are all challenges. Um, well, look, but these issues, I mean, if you take waiting times, we have the Audit Scotland report saying that we are seeing more patients within these targets because the investment we're putting in is having that effect. So we are having uh, improvements and delivering improvements. There have been issues with the construction of the Sick Kids Hospital in Edinburgh with a, a ventilation system. We are putting that right. Uh, that is going to be... Nine years late and it's still uh, not open. We, there have been construction difficulties. I don't uh, deny that at all. There is going to be a full public inquiry into the reasons around that on drugs. Uh, we have an issue. Some of the reasons for that go back a long time. We have a task force that is looking uh, at the 
solutions we have to take forward there. We have increased the investment in drug treatment services. So health services everywhere have challenges. We are not immune from that. But I uh, believe that we are doing the things that are required to fix those challenges and to make sure that we have the health service that people expect. And patient satisfaction ratings for NHS Scotland remain extremely high. They're high in England take... too. Well, look, so but on many of these things you're talking about, what we are doing in Scotland is way beyond what any other part of the UK is yeah. doing. First Minister, thank you, thank you. for that. This has been the first in a series of leaders' interviews during this general election. Tomorrow night, it's Jeremy Corbyn at the earlier time of 7pm on BBC One.